Welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. I'm D.W. Draffen, and today we're sharing a new feature, a series we're calling Ancient News. We're speaking every week now with James Fleischman from Ancient Beat, a newsletter he's created that covers all the new stories that come from the world of ancient history, archaeology, and anthropology. So let's get to it. Hello, so let's get started. Uh, we've got James today from Ancient Beat, and we'd like to talk to him about everything he's got going on with his newsletter. Um, James, could you tell us a bit about what your newsletter is all about, its scope, um, where it comes from, and where you'd like to see it going? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good question. Um, so it's called Ancient Beat. It, uh, it covers all the latest archaeological news also some of the more ancient anthropological news um, and some historical as well. So we're just trying to look back in time and uh, get a better understanding of, uh, well, I guess the latest discoveries as well as what was going on back then. Um, I have a particular interest in prehistory, but we cover pretty much everything we've gotten, I think as late as the 17th or 18th century and uh, as far back as well as we can really go with these disciplines. Um, as far as where I want it to go, I don't know, this is kind of a passion project for me. I've, I just really love this topic, so I'm just seeing what happens with it and enjoying myself. But uh, I'd love to build this thing as far as I can. That's great. We are all amateurs here. I, w I want to uh, talk a bit more about pushing it back as far as we can. Our origin stories keep pushing the scope of history further back in time, uh, w especially with a lot of the new technologies uh, that are coming out and need a forum for the tons of papers and new research projects that are getting started uh, in archaeogenetics and paleogenomics and isotope sampling uh, and even ground penetrating radar, the LIDAR. These are subjects that our community evidently wants to know a lot more about and we are happy to give those subjects to them. I've noticed that's a real focus in your newsletter as well. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I think uh, one of these topics that we'll, that we'll touch on today actually is, is kind of spot on with that, uh, pushing back the, the dating through, uh, through new kind of genomic uh, analysis. So, yeah, it's really exciting. It's a good time to be, to be looking into all this stuff. Fantastic. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, what's the first story you've got for us today? Well, the first one is, it, it kind of blew me away, so it had to be the first one. So a megalithic complex was discovered in Spain. I mean, I think any megalithic complex at this point in Europe is pretty surprising to find. But to find one that has 526 standing stones uh, and covers 1,500 acres just kind of blew me away. It, I really didn't know that such a discovery could still be found. And uh, it's kind of a mystery to me how it actually went undiscovered until now. Uh, the complex includes dolmens, mounds, kists, and enclosures. Um, it's uh, in the province of Huelva in Spain, and they found it uh, while surveying for an avocado plantation. Yeah, so they, they think it dates back to the 5th or 6th millennium BCE. Um, the standing stones are all between 1 and 3 meters. Uh, some are on the ground, but they're all in excellent condition. Jose Antonio Linares qu uh, said, quote, this is the biggest and most diverse collection of standing stones grouped together in the Iberian Peninsula, end quote. And then we've got Primitiva Bueno, who said, quote, Finding alignments and dolmens on one site is not very common. Here you find everything all together, alignments, cromlechs, dolmens, and that is very striking, end quote. So that touches on something else, that we have 26 alignments here. We have two circles, and these circles also have a clear view of the sunrise on the solstices and the equinoxes. So... There's a lot there. It's pretty fascinating, um, and they're planning to do excavations going out until 2026, so I assume we're going to have a whole lot more news coming from them. The surveys uh, that, and also probably just the funding of archaeology departments around the world that allow them to look in the places that they know things might be. Yeah. Well, and I think one thing that it's important to note here is we often hear these discoveries and uh, get blown away by them, but Oftentimes, the, the locals knew all about it, and this is just the first time that it's uh, hitting a wider audience and getting into academia. So 
Um, I'd be interested in hearing the locals and uh, what they have to say about it. But um, but yeah, nonetheless, just a fascinating find. I was this is one of the <laughs> when you're curating a kind of a um, archaeological newsletter, it's this type of thing that you're waiting for. The the huge news like this, it's really exciting. Thanks for sharing it. And before we move on to the second one, this is only a small portion of what James comes out with on his newsletter each week for you to continue feeding your addiction to ancient history. What do you have next for us? Okay, so the next one, this study is actually a couple of months old, but it's just hitting the, the headlines now. So um, hundreds of blades, as well as bone needles and a hearth uh, with animal rem remains were found in and I'm probably gonna butcher the name here, uh, but it's Huchiva Cave, I believe, in uh, Slovakia. So the find dates back to the Paleolithic, which would make these hunters part of the Magdalenian culture. Um, and this is pretty significant because uh, until now, we didn't have any evidence of Paleolithic humans in the Tatra Mountains of Eastern Europe. A uh, couple notable things about it, the, uh, <clears throat> the animal remains in the cave include the bones of deer, uh, wild horses, and shami. And a shami is kind of a, a goat antelope, apparently. Um, and many of these bones have traces of uh, cut marks, cracking for the marrow, and smoothing. Um, and then the last thing to say is that the researchers uh, suggest that these hunters were probably specialized in hunting uh, alpine ibex. So I've been in these mountains. I uh, got to hike them when my daughter was very little. We were still carrying her, and we took off one rainy day uh, from the little town of Martine and uh, tried to follow what we thought was a trail uh, that led up into a very steep forest. And uh, just as we were thinking of turning back, uh, we heard this horrible screaming, crashing sound, like, like almost like cattle jumping off a cliff or something. Uh, totally spooked us. Uh, we thought about turning around, but we just wanted to see what the ridge looked like uh, once. And then we heard it again much closer, and it was a giant bull elk standing just upslope from us, huge rack, and obviously with his territorial call. So that <laughs> got us to turn around and found us at a train stop heading back to Poland uh, just a few hours later. Uh, but I remember those mountains being very remote, inhospitable vertical faces. And if you think about being a Paleolithic uh, person, you want level surfaces to live, to thrive, to process food. Well, first of all, that sounds terrifying. I think you made a, a good choice in turning back there. <laughs> uh, I guess the, the vertical nature of this, I think that's probably why they assume that, um, that these hunters were in there um, hunting the, the al alpine and ibex. And I think uh, as far as the the remains in the cave, it seems, I would guess that maybe this was a hunting camp. Maybe these people went out there um, in order to get these ibex, came back, and uh, what we see in there is, you know, what they were doing while they were on their, on their hunt. Um, that would be my assumption. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I, I think that living, like you said, in one of these kind of more <laughs> difficult regions to, to get by in would be, would be tough. Living on slopes is extremely difficult, and... I could see why that would be one of the last places in the area where the Magdalenians penetrated. So what about uh, the next story? All right, so the next one. Um, excavations in uh, Bay Gruven, Mauritia National Park in Israel uh, revealed a collection of astragaloi. Um, now, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but astragaloi, they're uh, ankle or hock bones from animals like goats or sheep, which are used as a form, uh, or in a form of divination called astragalomancy. Uh, and so essentially you take five of these bones, you cast them, and then you interpret uh, the how they lay. Um, and sometimes it'll take one and then cast it five times, apparently. Uh, so a, kind of a cache of these was found, um, and uh, they go back to about 2,300 years ago. They are found in artificial caves, and they have uh, all these inscriptions on them. So some of them might be kind of what you might expect. Um, we've got Greek gods and goddesses on them, but some have kind of odd descriptions, uh, or sorry, inscriptions uh, that say things like robber or you are burnt. So <laughs> whatever that means. But uh, yeah, I thought this was a pretty interesting one. I do have a, a quote here from Lee Perigal. Um, the large assemblage of astragaloi from Mauritius 
uh, is unique in quantity and quality, as well as in the many inscriptions. So this one I thought was pretty interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, the first being uh, just any kind of ancient uh, custom like this, these practices always fascinate me. And then also looking at how those have uh, kind of continued into our modern times, the different you know, types of divination, even though we might not call it that, we, that we use to this day. So the other thing that I found really fascinating about this was uh, that I, I just recently covered something about, um, about Roman dice and how uh, for the longest time they thought that all these Romans were cheaters because uh, they found that these dice had kind of irregular sides and therefore they would tend to fall on a one or a six. The long story short is that they found that this actually wasn't the case and it's more likely that um, the reason that there were these kind of irregularities was that uh, probability wasn't really much of a thing for them. Instead, uh, they relied on kind of the will of the gods in the role of the dice. And so I think this kind of, it's a similar uh, kind of idea where the cast of the dice, it's all about what the gods are trying to show you in this divination. So I just thought that it was a kind of an interesting connection uh, with two studies that came out pretty, pretty close together. What I find really interesting is that you, this is an archaeological site in Israel, uh, which, of course, uh, was colonized by the Greeks, I think, on more than one occasion. Uh, but these are the cultural products that we see. And this is how culture spreads, not just in temples with thousands of people, but in these tiny little private lowbrow this might have been a, nothing more than gambling or a game, uh, but still the Greeks brought it to them. Yeah, these uh, culture doesn't just spread uh, through kind of the, the things that we hear about it, spread in the back alleys. All right, moving on, what do you have for us next? All right, so the fourth is, uh, oh yeah, so researchers found tufa deposits um, at an archeological site in Gamohana Hill in South Africa. Uh, which is indicating that uh, the southern Kalahari has had streams, pools, and waterfalls for the last 110,000 years. Um, I didn't know what a tufa was, uh, so maybe you did, but uh, I looked it up. And it's, so it's a porous sedimentary rock um, that's formed by the evaporation of springs. So that makes a little more sense when you understand what that is. So the researchers also found connections between this water and a human presence. Uh, indicating that Homo sapiens survived in the Kalahari Desert more than 20,000 years ago. It kind of pushes back on coastal-centric hypotheses uh, of the evolution of Homo sapiens, for one. Uh, it also builds on a previous study that provided evidence of innovative technological behaviors uh, and the collection of non-utilitarian objects indicating that humans were thriving in the same area 105,000 years ago. For me, there's, there's a couple things here. I, I love the topic of springs springs in general uh, and how they were sacred to the ancients and why they were sacred and not just as a place for you know hydration i always find anything that touches on that is an interesting thing when they're taking the samples of these uh of these rocks they had to be very very careful because to this day this is a sacred site for local people there um yeah and then the other thing i guess was just some interesting studies coming out of africa there's been a lot lately um, the latest that, that I was thinking about was um, that they, they reanalyzed uh, 23 um, uh, teeth that were supposed to come from the, the, ho the Homo uh, genus, and uh, they found that only seven of them actually were, uh, after reanalysis, uh, from Homo. The others were uh, either Australopithecus or uh, Paranthropus. So um, that was an interesting one. We, we, we're seeing a lot coming out of Africa right now, which is very interesting. In our origin stories, uh, there are so many African stories, and for so long we've had such a dearth of uh, material, uh, papers, focus, archaeological ruins. But the work in mitochondrial DNA, autosomal DNA, really starting to pry back standstill events that formed the modern haplogroups that eventually swept across the rest of the world. Nice. Look forward to, to, to watching some of that. Sounds fascinating. And then finally, we have one more story. So there hasn't been any articles that I've found on this yet. This was a, a study that I was looking at. Um, brand new, just came out a couple of days ago. Um, so I really had to kind of chew through it. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's see if I can synthesize it a little bit here. Basically, there's a new paper out. It's the first to um, contrast current knowledge about uh, the Q haplogroup 
um, with historical, archaeological, and linguistic data. Uh, so for those who don't know, the Q Haplo group is, uh, it basically includes nearly all of the First Nations people of Mesoamerica and South America. Um, so they uh, did analysis of Y chromosome sequences um, and this supported there being a South American settlement prior to 16,000 BCE. Uh, further, the study explored um, how the Younger Dryas period um, may have affected the First Nations people. Um, unsurprisingly, they found that it could have caused uh, significant loss of lineages and that this may have uh, then even caused the expansion of the QM848 sublineage. Now, I am not a geneticist, so I did a little digging into, into that, um, and it turns out QM848 uh, is the most represented QM3 sublineage, uh, is by far the most frequent and widespread haplogroup throughout the Americas. Uh, so yeah, this was a fascinating one, um, mostly because if we're looking at about like, you know, prior to 16,000 uh, BCE, that's kind of pushing the date back. Um, I know there's been some, uh, some sites found in Chile that go back to 14.5, I think. It's either, it's either 14.5 before present or 14.5 uh, BC. I, I don't remember offhand, but... Um, Hotly contested. Yeah, and very contested. Yeah, absolutely. As, as is really anything about the peopling of the Americas. It's, uh, it's a hot topic right now. Um, but yeah, so that, uh, that pushes that back. And, it, and interestingly, it even goes back further than what our, um, I guess, until recently, what our understanding was of the peopling of North America, which should be, a, you know, the first stop. So many disputes these days we know are those who hold that coastal populations moved down before the Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets opened up and allowed for the divide between the Rockies and the Great Plains. The problem has always been that we don't have any archaeological evidence. There are some new mitochondrial DNA studies. I just did this for the Origins of the First Americans episode that I produced a few weeks ago, and almost immediately it became dated. I think it was the next day that um, uh, we heard from New Mexico that there may be f footprints that massively predate all of these things that we're talking about as well as in another one in, in Utah. So I've tried to add an addendum in the comments, uh, but everything is moving so fast. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how that happens. Uh, <laughs> timing was a little unfortunate, but yeah, we've had a couple of sets of footprints um, in the last, last um, few months that have just blown people away, both in Utah and New Mexico, uh, which is just fascinating. And, and also, uh, this is kind of a side note, but the... The amount of luck that was required in, in seeing this latest in, in Utah, the, the ghost footprints that they found, it was the, the moisture in the air had to be just right. They happened to be driving to a hearth site um, that was nearby at that exact time. It was just, and then the person who saw it happened to know what, what it might be and then stopped the car. It's just, it's, it's fascinating, this stuff. And it makes you really think, and this is similar to what we were talking about in, in Europe with those standing stones, like what else is out there that like, we feel like we've explored so much, uh, but there's so much left to find. So many things had to line up for this to happen, or there are so many things out there that we in inevitably bump into them uh, despite not even really paying attention. That sounds kind of like us. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's well put. Yeah, I think that could be it. Uh, well, great. Uh, these are uh, five of the many stories that Ancient Beat provides uh, not only in their newsletter, but into your inbox if you want to subscribe, which is really what we're all about here. Building community, getting people talking to each other. I'm sure everybody has will have a lot to say in the comments about what we've discussed, as well as um, the name of the cat, which is Monkey Man. Feel free to correct us or enlarge upon any of these studies or continue the conversation there. We look forward to it. And James, um, thank you so much. And we look forward to talking to you more, uh, hopefully next week. Thank you, David. It's really an honor. I really appreciate you bringing me on. Great. Well, we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone.